Good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm Sebastian Lay. Uh, I, well, I work for tonight's speaker. Um, <laughs> that is my privilege. <laughs> um, but I do have some housekeeping things to take care of. Uh, but, but before the usual, turn off your cell phones, which I'll circle back to because it's very important. Um, I do want to make just two announcements. Uh, one is on Tuesday, July 9th, so that's next Tuesday. Uh, we, in, well, the friends of the MBL, formerly the MBL Associates, uh, would like to inv invite you to join them for a potluck picnic at Stony Beach. Uh, so the friends of the MBL provides us with a community connection and generally helps uh, support the MBL, uh, provides us with uh, a generous supply of really enthusiastic tour guides who uh, make our tour program possible. Um, and we're, they are hosting a picnic at Stony Beach. Um, I think many of you probably spend time there. Some of you may know the history of Stony Beach. Uh, it's a wonderful place that's um, really played a special part in many generations of MBL and Woods Hole families. So we hope you can join us there. Uh, that's from 6 to 8 p.m. Uh, and, oh, and there will be ice cream, I'm told. So. <laughs> And cold drinks, importantly, if the weather's anything like it was this week. Uh, and then uh, a, a week later, about uh, Monday, July 15th, we will be screening a documentary called Above and Beyond, NASA's Journey to Tomorrow. Uh, it was directed by Rory Kennedy, who is the sister of one of our uh, trustees. And uh, as you, some of you may know, uh, there have been a, a couple of different um, NASA missions that have had some MBL associations with them, including one of my favorites, sending toadfish into space. But uh, that would be a digression. So uh, uh, first of all, uh, thank you for coming. 130 years plus now of these uh, exchanges of, of brilliant ideas and fascinating science um, that I think we're all happy to be a part of. But uh, it's only effective if we all turn off our modern communication devices and can focus on the task at hand. So please make sure your cell phones are off. Um, if you don't have time to ask questions following tonight's talk, uh, there will be a reception in the Megs room. Follow the crowd. Um, Tonight's lecture is both simulcast and recorded, so if you have to leave, hopefully you don't, uh, or if you have friends at home you want to share it with, you can send the link. Uh, aside from that, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Steve Zottoli, a uh, very prominent member of the MBL community and a very important figure to me who really helped me to learn about the MBL, its culture, and the science. So thank you, Steve, and thank all of you. Wow, what a group. Welcome, everyone. Um, welcome to the fourth uh, Friday night lecture for 2019. And this lecture is in honor of Shelley Siegel. You can see here, uh, in addition to being an, an extraordinary scientist, Shelley was dedicated to the MBL, acting as trustee for many years and chairman of the board. Uh, the uh, Harriet and Shelley Siegel were very important to me over the years. Uh, when I brought Williams students here, they'd open their home, and they'd invite the students over, and they'd talk about career paths and science and writing, and uh, all, all done with a large plate of chocolate chip cookies. <laughs> uh, and the students really appreciated uh, that that generosity that they showed to them. Uh, the, the, um, my, my pleasure, oh, I, I, on behalf of the MBL, actually, I, I want to thank the Siegel family, and especially Harriet Siegel, who's here tonight, for their generosity uh, to the MBL over the years. And I thank you personally, and the MBL thanks you. It's my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Nipam um, Patel, who comes to us most recently from the University of California, Berkeley. But in actual fact, he's been with us since 2001. 
acting as co-director and instructor in the embryology course. This is an exciting time for the MBL. Uh, there are uh, a number of new educational initiatives and research initiatives um, that are, are occurring currently. And uh, NEPOM brings to the MBL a passion for teaching and a research area that involves expertise in imaging and the use of that imaging in studying patterns, both in uh, amphipod crustaceans and butterflies, both of which you'll hear about tonight. Uh, NEPOM is uh, an individual that speaks to the roots of the MBL in the fact that he has, a, he has that passion for teaching and a research which fits quite well. And the roots go back to uh, uh, Whitman's first report in 1888 uh, of the MBL where he said, quote, to limit the work of the laboratory to teaching would be a, mo a most serious mistake. And to exclude teaching would shut out the possibilities of the highest development. The combination of the two functions in mutually stimulating relations, meaning research and teaching, is a feature of the laboratory to be strongly commended. I uh, now introduce to you Nipam Patel, and I'm sure you'll enjoy this lecture. Thanks, Steve. All right, thank you all. It's a real pleasure to be here and to get a chance to uh, give this presentation. So again, I'd also like to extend my um, thanks to the Siegel family. Um, I never had the opportunity to meet Shelley, but um, I'm aware of the incredible contributions that he's made to the MBL, and it's my honor to give this lecture this evening. So like many people who are interested in biology, one of the things that's always fascinated me is the diversity of organisms, and that's sort of illustrated here on a somewhat animal-centric slide. But it, il it illustrates the kind of incredible diversity that has been created by biological evolution. And as a developmental biologist, I'm really interested in how these organisms all come to this form from a very similar looking single cell embryo. Um, and the question has been, what are the genetic and molecular underpinnings for this diversification? So as a developmental biologist, many of us are driven by work in what we call model systems. So most work has gone on in a few set species, which for a variety of reasons, researchers have focused on. And this just shows a couple of them, Drosophila melanogaster, the food fly, zebrafish, mice, nematodes. And these things have become what we call model organisms for very good reasons, right? So one of the, the keys is that they have a rapid generation time. They're relatively inexpensive to raise in large numbers. And because of this, um, people have started to work on them, and then large communities have built up around them who've then developed a lot of tools at the molecular and genetic level to be able to understand them in great detail. And that actually has been fundamental and fantastic for the field of biology because those tools have allowed us to understand how they go from a single cell embryo into a multicellular organism in incredible detail. But there are some shortcomings to focusing in on certain organisms. And that's that a lot of interesting traits are not actually covered by these model organisms. And so one of the themes I'd like to propose for this evening is to explain to you why it's so important to expand the repertoire of organisms that are studied in order to understand a lot of interesting biological phenomena. And so one way my sort of elevator pitch for this is that, you know, in fact, biology has solved most problems. Right? And it's just a matter of finding the organism that's already solved that problem and then understanding how it solved that problem. And so that's what I've got to illustrate to you today is two examples from my own research about how we approach that. And one is trying to understand complexity in crustaceans and another is trying to understand color patterning in butterflies. So I'll start with the example of crustaceans. So here's a typical crustacean. It's a mantis shrimp, right, which many of you might be familiar with. And one of the things that's always fascinated me is that it has, like all crustaceans, it has a pair of appendages on every single segment. 
And so it can specify a lot of appendages, but it can actually do a lot of different things with those appendages. And you're familiar with this if you've ever dealt with a lobster that didn't have rubber bands on its claws, okay? <laughs> So it can attack you, it can eat, and it can run away all at the same time because it has different legs to do different things. So we kind of analogize this as kind of a Swiss army knife approach to a body plan, right? So you deploy all these multiple tools on the body and they can do different things. But what we've been interested in is, well, how do you, at a molecular and genetic level, set this up? So how do you make all of these different types of appendages and make them different in, both in morphology and in function from each other? And so we started approaching this question quite a long time ago, so I would say almost 20 years ago in my lab. And what we needed was a, a species that we could actually turn into an experimentally tractable system. So it's easy to go out there and collect lobsters or crabs or any number of crustaceans and admire them. But it's another thing to actually be able to experiment on them and understand how they work. So what we did is we looked for a crustacean that we could develop in the lab to do exactly these kinds of detailed experiments. And the animal we settled on is this one here called Pahela hawaiensis. So the type specimen comes from Hawaii. But if you're anywhere on a tropical beach anywhere in the world, you will see these. Around here, you don't get this species, but you get related ones. So if you're on a beach and you see gray things jumping in the sand and on the seaweed, it's this group of crustaceans. So they occur all over the world. But the, where we isolated this, acquire, this particular species is an interesting story. So at the time, I was a faculty member at the University of Chicago, and Bill Brown was a graduate student in my lab. What he did is he went to the Shedd Aquarium, but instead of looking in the display tanks where they show off things, he went to the filtration system of the aquarium. And these are the animals that live in the filters, and they just eat the garbage that comes in the filters. No one takes care of them, and they do perfectly fine. So by definition, then, they're a very good lab animal, right? Because scientists are <laughs> not that good at taking care of animals, really. And so, and it has a lot of, of traits that make it very easy. One is for a marine creature, it's very tolerant of how it's raised. And it has a generation time of about seven weeks. Um, so it has a number of characteristics that are useful. And in the lab, it lives like this. So this is just a little flat of seawater with an air stone to bubble the water. And then this is a carrot. So they're all over the carrot eating the carrot. So they turn very orange, and presumably they see very well. But they're, they're, you'll see a couple of them crawling off. And the females have a brood of eggs anywhere from like 20 to 40 every two weeks. So they reproduce quite readily. And this is what the adults look like. This is a micro TC scan. And you can see all of these appendages. So just like all the other crustaceans I showed you, they deploy all of these different appendages for different functions. And I'll tell you a little bit about what these appendages are. So this is just a schematic of the body plan. So T stands for thoracic segments, and A stands for abdominal. And I'll just focus on those. And so, in fact, the first leg that they have on their first thoracic segment is actually specialized for feeding. So it's modified to look more like a jaw appendage than it is a locomotor appendage, and they use it to eat. And then the next two legs here have the little claws on them, so they use them to pick up food and to walk. And then the next two are just what we call forward walking legs, so they're a typical crustacean leg that it uses to crawl forward. But then the next three thoracic legs here are these big reverse jumping legs. So I told you that where you usually see these on the beach jumping through the air, and that's their escape response. And so they use these massive legs to lift themselves up into the air when they want to get away from you. And then on the abdomen, they have six appendages. Three of them are what are called pleopods. They're little feathery appendages they use to swim through the water. And the last three are uropods, and they look like little anchors that they stick down in the sand when they don't want to get swept around by the current. Okay, and so what we wanted to know is, well, how do you set up all these different kinds of appendages? And when we started this work, our approach was to think in the model organisms, which have been so successful in guiding us to general principles of development, could we take from that clues as to how to think about this? And so what we turn to is a set of genes that had first been identified in the fruit fly, Drosophila melanogaster. They're a set of genes called Hox or homeotic genes. And their set of genes is actually, as I'll show you later, are well conserved in all animals, including you. And what they do is they serve a role of determining regional identity along the head to tail axis. So they're expressed at various positions along the body, and they determine what kind of segment is there. So we wanted to ask the question, well, do they seem to be the genes that control this kind of pattern in Parhyla, in the crustacean we were interested in? So the first thing we did is we cloned this, isolated this set of genes 
out of the crustacean parhyala. And what you're looking at here is a series of parhyala embryos. So they're oriented with their head up and their tail down. And what you see in red is where those particular genes are being turned on in the body. And what you see is they're expressed in these block-like patterns going from the head to the tail of the animal. And that's exactly how they're expressed in all animals. Okay? And then you can line those patterns. So now we show a schematic where we show where those genes are expressed. And we line them up to the different kinds of appendages. And there are very specific correlations between where the boundary of one of those genes occurs and the type of appendage that's there. Okay. But this is the problem that we run into with these kind of what we would call the non-traditional research organisms, is that we can do some interesting experiments like this, but then when it comes time to testing hypotheses about them, we're kind of stuck, because how do we actually manipulate them? How do we develop the tools to do that? So fortunately for us, a lot of the tools that are being developed in organisms like mice and flies and nematodes and zebrafish are now actually directly transferable to these other organisms. And one of the ones that you've probably heard a lot about is CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing. Okay, so this is a way to go in, and this is just a, a little illustration of how the system works, that we can guide an enzyme to a particular location in a gene and cut the DNA. And what happens is the cell will try to replace, re repair that break, but when it does, it usually introduces some errors and the gene is made non-functional. And so we can use this to knock out the function of a gene and ask, well, what does this gene really do for the animal? So again, we can look at its expression, we know what it does in, a, in something like a fly, but can we predict what it would do in our crustacean? So now we don't have to just guess, we can do the experiment. So I'll just show you an example of this. So this is, again, the wild-type animal. And what I've colorized are those big jumping legs. And one of the genes we isolated is expressed in these legs. And we asked, well, does it really control what these legs do, what they look like? And what would happen if we took this gene out? So the next animal I'm going to show you is one where we went in and we deleted the gene and asked, well, what goes wrong with the animal? So in that animal, here's what it looks like. So those big reverse jumping legs are transformed into these forward legs. So now it doesn't have any of the jumping legs, but it has extra forward legs, okay? The genes also express more posteriorly, where normally you have these swimming legs, and when you knock it out, you actually get more anchor legs. So using this kind of approach, we can systematically go through the animal and understand exactly how the segments are patterned. And I won't try to show you all the details of these kinds of experiments, but I'll show you a summary diagram. So to the outside are the wild-type limbs, and towards the inside are the mutant phenotypes when we knock out each of these genes that controls the body plan. And what you can see, hopefully, from this is that from this we can decode the genes that control each type of appendage. And, from, and we understand now in great detail how you build each of these types of appendages, which is far more complicated than the body plan you might see in a fruit fly. But now we understand how it's modified the interaction of these genes to do that. So that's wonderful for us from a developmental viewpoint. We understand in detail now how you make a crustacean body plan. But it's also useful in a number of ways. One of them is that now we can actually make predictions about how you make other crustaceans. So you see something like a lobster, which has a slightly different body plan from our parhyala. We can now predict how it would change its gene expression to make that body plan. And now, excitingly enough, we can go into those crustaceans and show that that's true. This has even broader implications because, as I said, this same set of genes is in you. And what it controls is the kind of vertebrae you have down your back. But of course, it's not really easy to experiment on humans. So the idea is that it's much easier to experiment on these other animals and understand in detail how these genes work. So that's one example I wanted to show you of how we sort of use this information in the non-traditional organisms to get a better idea of basic biology, which is applicable to all organisms. So the other organism I want to talk about is something that's near and dear to my heart, which are butterflies. So I started collecting butterflies when I was eight years old, and I've collected them ever since. And so if you'd like, there's a, a large collection of them next to the rare books here um, in Lilly. But that's where I keep my collection. And I've always been fascinated at turning them into something that I would also do research on. And so I think you'll all agree that butterflies are a particularly charismatic group of organisms. These are just some from my collection. And you can see that they have an incredible variety of colors and patterns. So what I want to do first is just tell you a little bit about, well, why do they have all these colors and patterns? So some of them are clearly to attract mates 
for visual communication with each other. But one of the things that butterflies and moths have to deal with are predators, and their main predators are things like birds and, and lizards and spiders and things like that. And it turns out that many of these colors and patterns that you see also provide them protection from that. And I want to illustrate a few examples of this before I tell you specifically the kind of research that we're doing with them. So this just lists some of the things that they do with these colors and patterns to protect themselves. The first one's probably fairly obvious, camouflage, right? So here's a nice example of a moth that's camouflaged to look like the bark that it's sitting on. Okay, and that's an obvious example where it breaks up its background, has some blend to the color, and it makes itself harder to see. My favorite example are these, these dead leaf butterflies that occur in Southeast Asia. And so for all the world, they look like a dead leaf on the underside. Okay? And so they sit down on the ground where they're dead leaves and they, and they blend in incredibly well. And they have a lot of really interesting genetic variations. So this is just six specimens from one location in China. And they're all the same species, but there's variation within the population so that no two individuals look exactly alike. And in this way, predators can never learn the exact pattern that they have. And there's always some leaves somewhere that look like them. Okay, and so this is a different species. This is a picture I took in Australia, and it's another butterfly that has a sort of a leaf-like pattern. If I hadn't seen where it landed, I never would have found it, right? And then they also have incredible behavioral adaptation. So this butterfly will lean into the sun so it doesn't cast a shadow as well, okay? So they go to great lengths to camouflage themselves. Another way they protect themselves is something that may not be as obvious to you at first, but if you try to catch butterflies, you might notice it. And it's called flash and dazzle coloration. A good example comes from these bright blue morpho butterflies. So if any of you have been to Central or South America, you might have seen them. If you've been to butterfly houses, you might see them flying around. So this bright blue is a sexual, select, sexual selection color. The males have this color on them, and the females don't. But the males can actually use this to their advantage when they're being chased because their underside is cryptically colored brown. And so what happens is when they're flying along, you see these bright blue flashes. And when they know they're being chased, what they'll do is they'll suddenly sit down. And they'll be on the ground as this brown butterfly. But your eyes keep looking for this bright blue flash. And so you'll just walk right by looking for them, and you'll miss them. And quite a number of butterflies actually use this protection. There's one flying right now that you might see that's very common, Red Admiral butterflies that have a bright red band on them. And you notice that red band when they're flying, but when they sit down, they're just brown. And your eyes lose sight of them. Okay. Another thing that they use is are patterns to deflect attacks away from their body. So butterflies can actually fly quite well as long as the leading edge of their forewing is still there. They can take quite a bit of damage to the wings. And remember, they are only the adult form. They just have to live long enough to find a mate and lay eggs. And so one example of this is found in these little hair streak butterflies, which are found all over the world. And so these butterflies have all their colorful patterns on their hind wing. And this pattern looks somewhat like their head. Okay, and so in fact, when you collect these butterflies or photograph them, instead they often look like this, right? So some predator has mistaken that for the head, and it's gone for a kill shot, and it's bit that off, but the butterfly is perfectly fine. It has a really short abdomen, too, so no, no vital parts get taken with that. And it actually has one more pair of false antennae here for another shot still, right? And it just needs to live another day to find a mate. Okay, so this is a very useful protection for it. Now, sometimes this gets carried away, and in the tropics, you get these elaborate, long um, tails on them. And in fact, in the tropics, some of the predators have learned to, to watch which way the butterfly flies and figure that's the head. And what these butterflies do is they do a 180-degree roll in the air before they land. They land backwards and run backwards, okay? And then they'll put their antenna down to look like their legs. And so for all the world, that looks like the front end, okay? Sometimes they also use their patterns to startle predators, okay? And a famous example of that are these owl butterflies, which have these giant eye spots on them, okay? And the idea is that these eye spots, they never sit like this, but the idea is those eye spots look like the eyes of a larger predator. So if you're a little lizard and you suddenly come across this, you think twice, right, before you attack it. And the butterfly just needs that moment to get away. Even this moth that has this camouflage color, if you startle it, this is what it does, okay? <laughs> and so again, a predator thinks for a second, like, well, maybe this isn't what I thought it was, right? And it gives the moth a chance to get away. Another common thing that some butterflies do is that as larvae, they will eat food plants that are toxic, and they'll accumulate these toxins in their body. 
Okay, and then they advertise that they're toxic. And probably one of the most famous examples in North America are monarch butterflies. So as larvae, they eat milkweed plants, and milkweed plants contain a cardiac poison, and they sequester that in their body. They can actually survive being tasted by birds, and if a bird tastes them, the bird throws up. And throwing up is a great single trial learning paradigm that if you eat something that makes you throw up, you don't eat it again. It doesn't apply to teenagers and beer, but it applies <laughs> to most other things, okay? And so they gain protection that way. Another great example is a huge group of butterflies in Central and South America called Heliconius butterflies. They all have this black base with beautiful red, orange, blue colors that really advertise to predators that they're toxic. But of course, when that happens, you always get cheaters, right? So then you get butterflies or moths that mimic those unpalatable butterflies. And so again, a very famous example in North America is the viceroy, which is a monarch, which is a mimic of the monarch. Okay, and this gets carried again to extremes in the tropics. So these are all unpalatable butterflies that live in the tropics. These are all moths that mimic them. But interestingly enough, all these moths themselves are also unpalatable. So both species gain by doing this, because the bird or, bu or lizard only has to learn one pattern and not two different patterns. But in this example, these are un uh, all unpalatable monarch relatives that live in Southeast Asia, and these are all palatable swallowtails that are distantly related, but mimic all of these butterflies. These are actually two of the same species, but they have two different forms that mimic two different unpalatable butterflies. So what I want to talk about, though, and that's, that's a little bit about why butterflies have these colors and patterns. But what I want to talk today about is how they get those colors, and in particular, how they get the colors of green and blue, because there's an interesting story about that. So where do butterflies end up with color, right? So if you've, you've probably been told many times not to touch the wings of butterflies, right? And if you touch them, this sort of dust rubs off, and it's the scales of the butterfly, which are their units of color. Now, the wing is not alive, so if you rub off scales, they can't grow back, which is why you're told not to touch them. So what are the scales? So this is a magnified view, and the scales look like little tiles on the wing, okay? And these scales are the unit of color. They're a dead remnant of a cell that was growing when it was a chrysalis, when it was in the pupae, and then they grew out, and then they filled with color, in this case, pigment colors that I'll describe, and then the cell isn't alive anymore on the wing, but this gives it the color, all right? So this is a scanning electron micrograph of the scale. So they're held in place by a socket, and they're this big extension, and the scale is something like 300 microns long and about 50 microns wide. So as something that you look at, it's very small, but as an extension of a cell, it's quite large. And before it dies, it becomes coated in what's called chitin. This is the extra exoskeleton of the animal. So if you ever crush an ant or any other arthropod, the hard outside is called chitin. It's a polymer of sugar that it uses to make its external skeleton. It uses that same material to make the scale, and all scales have these kind of ridges on them that help them structurally. So, so again, how big are these things? So I said they're about 300 microns long and about 50 microns wide. And just to give you a scale on that, a human hair is roughly about 80 microns in diameter. So it's kind of on that order of magnitude size, all right? And so when you see colors like this, these yellows, browns, blacks, and so on, these are pigments that fill the scale before it dies, right? And it turns out that pigments make up all of what we call the long wavelengths of the rainbow. So reds, oranges, yellows, blacks, um, browns, and so on, okay? And pigments are something that's reasonably familiar to you. So you think of these as things that you might dye your clothes with and things like that. And what they are, they're small molecules that absorb specific colors of light, and what's left gives you the impression of color. A good way to illustrate this is with like the pigments that make up highlighters. So these are the different molecules, organic compounds that are in your highlighter ink to give it color. And a good example is from yellow. So it's this carbon compound here that makes it yellow. Why is it yellow? So these rings of carbon are, have a, a particular structure that absorbs blue light very efficiently. So if you absorb blue light, what's left is red and green light, and you perceive that as a yellow color. So that's how pigment colors work. They're small molecules that absorb particular wavelengths of light and give you the impression of color. It turns out, for a variety of reasons, that when most animals make green and blue, so these are the short wavelengths of the rainbow, they can't do this with pigment. So the one big exception in the world is chlorophyll, which makes plants green. 
So that's a very efficient molecule at absorbing red light, which is why they're green. But it turns out that it's very rare to make pigment molecules that it can absorb in long wavelengths. So instead, you have a phenomena called structural color, which I'll describe to you in a little detail, where you actually refract light to make color instead of using pigment. And this isn't a solution that only butterflies use. So it turns out that many blues and greens in the animal kingdom are made this way. So iridescent blues and greens on bird feathers, even human blue eyes are made this way. If you have blue eyes, you actually don't have a blue pigment in your eye. You have a structure in the surface of your eye that refracts light to create blue. So what do I mean by light refraction? So the easiest way to think about this is really to think about a soap bubble. So the soap doesn't have any color, but why does this bubble have all the colors of the rainbow, okay? So it's an interesting phenomena of light that occurs when materials become very thin, okay? And it's a set of, of phenomena that's been known for almost a century, that when you have a very thin material that light can pass through, when light hits it, it reflects off the top surface and it reflects off the bottom surface. But remember, you might remember from your physics that light also has wave-like properties. And so these waves, when they come back out of the top and bottom surface, they can actually interfere in various ways with each other. If they're in phase, when they come off of these two reflections, right, then they actually amplify each other and they look brighter. So in fact, if the amplitude doubles by them being in what we call constructive interference, it'll look four times brighter to you. If they are out of phase, when they come out of those reflections, they'll destructively interfere and that wavelength will actually disappear. Okay, and you won't see that color. And each color of light is a different wavelength. So different, some wavelengths in a particular material will undergo constructive interference and others will go destructive interference. But how thin do you have to be to do this? You have to be somewhere around a half wavelength of light. Okay, so now you're talking about an incredibly tiny, fine distance that you have to pattern. So again, this was your 50 microns for a scale, 80 microns for a human hair. So for, for to get, for example, constructive interference of yellow light, you need a material that's about 600 nanometers thin. So about two orders of magnitude thinner than a human hair, but it has to be exactly that thickness. Okay, so it turns out that a lot of creatures actually can do this. They can make materials of very precise thicknesses in this range. So the equation that defines the, the wavelengths that go undergo destructive and constructive interference are given by this equation. So the constructive interference is this equation. If you take out this one half, you get the destructive interference. You don't have to worry in any detail about this. Just that there are a couple things. One is that the angle matters, and that's why these colors shift a little bit depending on the angle you view them, okay? And that the, what's the key is the thickness of this material, all right? And so that's going to, going to dictate this. And you can make this even more apparent if you multiply these layers over and over and you get reflections off of each layer. So what I'm gonna know, show you next is an example of a butter, of, actually of a moth that does this. And the only pigment in this moth is black. Okay, and yet it has all the colors of the rainbow. And it makes all those colors in this method. So the individual scales are extremely thin layers of chitin which are properly spaced to make any color the moth wants to make. Okay, but it doesn't need pigments to do this. It can do this by this light interference phenomena. Another example comes from those bright blue morpho butterflies which have that spectacular color. There's not any blue pigment in this wing. So if you were to crush it up, it would just be brown. Okay, so one of the ways that we can show that it's a structural color is a little experiment here. So this is a morpho wing, and what we're about to do is drop acetone on it. And acetone has a different refractive index, meaning a speed of light than air does, so the equation changes a little bit, okay? And what you're gonna see is when that acetone drops, the wing turns bright green, okay? Because that's because those equations have shifted a little bit. You have this nice bright green color, all right? So what do these, what do these wings have on them that allow us to do that? So if you zoom in, these are what the scales look like. They're again, nice bright blue. You zoom in further, they have ridges like every other scale. But if you cut through this in this orientation and you look at those ridges, they have this fantastic Christmas tree structure. And the spacing between the individual branches of these trees and between these trees is just right to get massive constructive interference of blue light, which is why they look blue to you. But there's no blue pigment in them. This is how they create all the blue. And then again, if we let this acetone evaporate back off, right now the air will go back in, the equations will go back to what they were before, and the wing will go back to being blue because the air has gone back in. 
Okay, so again, that's how you show that it's a structural color. Another nice example comes from these green hair streak butterflies, which you might fly, find flying around here. And so that green color gives them very good camouflage. Okay, if you look at one of their scales, you zoom in on it, and you see these little facets of green on them. Okay, and if you crack that open, what you see is this honeycomb pattern. But this honeycomb is a very specific shape called a gyroid, and this is incredibly small. But this shape actually has an interesting history. The shape was discovered in 1970 as an equation, as a mathematical equation that, that as a triply periodic structure that divides space into two equal areas. And it was just a math equation. And then people realized it existed in the real world inside of these scales. And it had just the right size to get constructive interference of green light, which is how they're green. Okay, so what happens is, is that most of these discoveries of the structure are made by optical physicists who cut open one of these scales, they figure out how the, what the structure looks like and they figure out the math, and then sometimes they spend like $100,000 and they make a square millimeter of it out of man-made material, and they're very happy with themselves. Okay, but what we're interested in as developmental biologists is, well, how did the butterfly make this, right? Because the butterfly doesn't seem to have a problem making this. So how do living cells actually make structures like this? And so we've turned to trying to address that question. And one of the butterflies we've looked at is this one, which has, again, a nice green band. It's called a peacock swallowtail from the Philippines. And the way it's green is that it has, the, this is what happens when you look at one of its scales. It has these little dimple reflectors in it. These dimples are curved, multi-layer of chitin air, but the geometry is just right that when white light hits the bottom of the dimple, it gives constructive interference of yellow light, but when it hits the side of the dimple, the spacing between layers is different, and blue light is retroreflected out. So it's yellow plus blue, so you see that as green, but these little dimples are only a few microns across, so your eye can't see that it's two different colors, so you just perceive it as green. The beauty of it is, is that this blue light becomes polarized. We don't see polarized light, but they do. So that means that they don't see themselves as the color of the vegetation, so they can see each other, but their vertebrate predators can't see them because they blend into the vegetation instead. And this is an example, again, where people have been able to recreate this mechanically using all sorts of approaches. But what we want to know, again, is how the butterfly makes structures like this. And I won't go into great detail, but I'll tell you that we've had a couple insights into this. So we've been able to look. The yellow here is a molecule called actin, which makes the internal skeleton of the scale. And the pink here is the chitin, that extracellular matrix that's being secreted. And you can see it uses that internal actin skeleton to pattern where those ridges are in the scales. Okay, And all scales do that. But in this butterfly that has the green color, one of the interesting phenomena that we've seen, this is the surface of the scale, and you're gonna see the actin, and it was rods, but then it turns into these amazing patterns of hexagons inside the cell. And using that, it can reorient the surface of the scale to make those reflectors. So one of the things we've been interested in is, well, how do you go from rods to hexagons, right? And you can think of a lot of ways you might do that, but one of the things we wanna do is actually watch the butterflies live do things like this. Well, now this is a challenge, because if you've ever raised butterflies, you know the chrysalis is opaque. You can't see into it. So one of the things we've been doing is developing ways to see into the living chrysalis of a butterfly. And this is a technique that actually was developed in the embryology course a couple years ago as an accidental failed experiment. So the actual purpose of the experiment didn't work, but the, the, the highlight of the experiment was that we were able to make butterflies that had windows onto the wings. And so what you're about to see is eight days of development, and you're gonna see the whole wing develop. So the wing is there, and you can see the wing veins. It's gonna turn a little silvery as the scales grow. And then towards the end of the movie, you're gonna see all the pigment colors come in. So you can see all of wing development occur in this window now. So at the end, you'll see all the pigments occur and the wing will be completely normal, okay? So now we can actually watch all of wing development. And then another breakthrough that happened, I, so this is a piece of data that I got actually just at five, uh, sorry, at 7.30 this evening, just before my talk. So I'm teaching in the physiology course this year as well, and I told the students I need data for my Friday evening lecture, so you have to generate it. 
And so one of the things we wanted to do is to actually watch actin live in the cell, because all of the other methods that we've had for visualizing actin in the cell require us to kill it. So if we want to watch what it does live, we need to watch it live. So this is a very preliminary movie, but you'll be able to see this is the actin inside the scales as the scales are growing. So this movie is over about 12 hours, and the scales have actually grown from little nubs into bees. Now we can't see the actual actin fibers yet, but we're working on improving that technique. So one step at a time, but it's great to see that, again, in the MBL tradition, we can make great leaps in our combining research and education. Okay, so the other approach that we've taken is a genetic one. So in this case, what we've used are these buckeye butterflies, which are very common. You see them all across North America. And you'll say, well, okay, why are you using these? Because they just all look like pigment colors. They're just brown and yellow and white and so on, right? But it turns out that they have close relatives that live all over the world that do have structural color. A lot of them have nice, beautiful blue colors on them. Okay, but these particular North American ones they don't usually, but when you catch them, every now and then you'll find a couple that have a little bit of structural blue on them. So these butterflies are also raised, the, but, the North American buckeyes are raised commercially. They're often used for wedding releases or butterfly houses. And there was a woman named Edith Smith who lived in Florida. She owned one of these companies and she raised the butterflies. And she realized there was a little blue on them sometimes. And she thought, hmm, what if I always take the blue ones and keep them and mate them to each other? And so after about 12 generations, which took about a year, she got them to be incredibly blue. Okay, and this was to her just the hobby. But she'd done what scientists would do. They did an experiment of artificial selection to select to make them blue. And now we can ask, well, what did she do? How did she make them blue? So if you look at the scales, this is the top surface of the scale and the bottom surface. It's actually the bottom surface of the scale that's blue. It's a thin layer of chitin on the bottom. And if you peel off the ridges on the top, it really is that lower layer. And what happens is, is that that lower layer, you're seeing a cross section of the scale, and that's that lower layer. It's reached just the right thickness to satisfy this equation of a really simple structural color reflector that makes blue. So the thickness is reached just one half the wavelength of blue light, but extremely precisely along the whole width of the whole length of the scale. So it's a blue reflector. But where did this come from? Because the butterflies were just brown. But if you take one of those brown butterflies and look at it, it's actually gold. So no one ever really seemed to recognize that it was also structurally colored. It has some pigment, but also a structural component. And that it's just the right thickness to be gold. So in fact, what happened is it went from being about 100 nanometers thick to about 190 nanometers thick. And that was enough to move it from brown to blue. And that's what she did in her selection. And sure enough, when you go and you look at these other species that have blue color, that's exactly what they did. So her artificial selection experiment recreated what evolution did and made them blue. So now we can actually use this as a way to find the genes that are responsible for it being blue. And that scheme is shown here. So now we can take the blue butterflies that she's raised. They're only a few generations separated from the brown, from the brown butterflies. But we can still mate them together. Okay, and so we can think of these as the grandparents. When we mate them together, we get their progeny. Their progeny contain equal chromosome components from the brown parent and the blue parent. Okay? But then if we mate any two of these together, because you recombine chromosomes, you exchange pieces of chromosomes when you make sperm and egg, the children, what we call the F2 generation, they all contain different components of the genes from either the brown grandparent or the blue grandparent. So we can look at each one of these progeny and we can ask, how blue is it? And what part of the genome did it inherit from the brown parent? And what part of the genome did it inherit from the blue parent? So we phenotype each of these. We ask how blue they are. And then we sequence them to ask what parts of the genome they got from each grandparent. So here's just a sample of the variation in that grandchildren, that F2 generation. So you can see that they vary in how much blue they have. But they also vary in the hue. So they go anywhere from blue to green to indigo. Okay, and so we can separate them by how much of the wing is covered by blue, right? It's the same color, but different parts of the wing are covered. And we can ask how this correlates with different regions of the genome. And this is just a little map. These are different chromosomes. And then this is a significance of whether that part of the genome shows a tight association with the color. And what you see is there's just two regions of the genome, these two big peaks that go over this statistical significance line, 
that associate with the how much of the wing is blue. So these are, it seems like there's just two genes somewhere in the genome or two loci in the genome that control the amount of blue, that how much of the blue, how, sorry, how much of the wing has this blue iridescence to it. We actually fortuitously know what this gene is already. It's a gene called optics, which in other butterflies is, controls the red pattern, but in our butterflies actually controls the blue pattern. And this is a butterfly where we've, where, um, we've knocked out the gene, this gene, and you can see now you suddenly get blue scales. And this was work done in, an, in another um, lab that, that we collaborate with on this. Um, and so you can see this sort of blue coloration. So we don't know, though, what this other gene is, and that's what we're interested in. But the other thing we can do is we can divide them up instead by, oops, sorry. We can divide them up instead by hue, sorry, uh, repeated, sorry, by accident. So we can instead divide them up by hue, by white, whether they're sort of indigo, blue, or green. And what that is is a very tight control of the exact thickness of the wing. So brown was about 100 nanometers, this is about 140, and this is about 200. So whatever these genes are, they control very precisely the thickness of the wing. And we can do the same sort of experiment, and there seem to be four genes in the genome somewhere that control that exact thickness. So we're, we don't know what those genes are, but we're excited to find those out because they control very precisely the thickness of the, of the bottom of the scale to about 10 nanometers, and that's incredibly precise. And if you ask right now from any of our model systems, do we know what gene could do that, we don't really have a good idea. So the beauty of this approach is we will discover what those genes are, and there'll probably be novel genes that we you know, wouldn't have had an idea that really do this. So hopefully from this I've shown you that you know, from these experiments we can understand the kinds of genes that control a big switch from being brown to being some sort of blue-green iridescent color, and then other genes that control the finer control of this. And I'll end just by saying one of the other things that we're studying in the lab that I won't go into is also trying to understand transparency in butterflies. So this is another phenomena that's evolved over and over is that they become transparent. And so not only are they transparent by just getting the scales out of the way, but if you think about it, if you just had a piece of glass and you went out in the sun, you would still see it because the sun would glare off of it. So sure enough, they've evolved anti-glare coatings on their wings to prevent glare. And again, they're nanostructures that diffuse the light so you don't get glare. So we're, that's another project that we have ongoing in the lab is to understand how they do that. So why do we do this kind of work, right? So for me, right, the big question, I'm just really into the basic science. I just want to know how the world works, right? But there's a lot of benefits from knowing these kinds of questions. They're not necessarily things I personally, you know, would spend most of my time on, but they have a real benefit to society, and I think that's something that we often need to communicate to the public. And in this case, right, these kinds of nanostructures that we're talking about making, they're actually really, they have a lot of useful applications in industry and medicine, but they're actually really difficult to make. And they're very expensive, and right now they require pretty harsh chemicals and synthetic methods, and that's very incompatible with then using them as biological material for drug delivery or things like that. So part of the idea is if we can understand how living cells make these things, we could find a much better and cheaper way to make them that would be compatible with using them as drug delivery systems and medications on their own. So that's part of you know, the interest in doing this, though again, I'm just fascinated at how a butterfly does this, right? So I'll end by just thanking the people in the lab that did the work. So the initial characterization of scales was done with April Dinwiddie, who was actually a, a course assistant in the embryology course a number of years ago, and we continued to collaborate on the project while she was a graduate student at Yale. And then people in my lab that have done the work, Rachel Thayer did all the work with the structural color in the Buckeyes, and Ryan Null did all that work on the Palinurus with with the dimples, and Kyle DeMar and Aaron Pomerantz have done much of the more recent work and are focused on transparency. And the earlier experiments that I showed you about the Hox genes in Parhyala and limb patterning were done by a former postdoc, Arno Martin, Aaron Jarvis, who's still in the lab, and Julia Serrano, a former lab member. And I'm very happy to take questions, and thank you very much. Can you 
please explain the difference between a moth and a butterfly. Okay, yeah. <laughs> so fair enough. So it would be like asking what's the difference between a human and a primate. So a butterfly is actually just a kind of moth. So moths are extremely diverse, and they're, as you usually think about them, and they're nocturnal. But in multiple times in evolution, they've evolved to fly in the day. And butterflies are just the largest group of day-flying moths. So they're just a special type of moth. So there's only one unique characteristic of butterflies, and that's that they have a unique shaped club-shaped antenna. And that's the only thing. And moths have lots of other shapes, but not that shape. So when you do the molecular analysis, butterflies do have a single origin, but they're nested inside of moths. I was wondering if you have ever tried to extrapolate the uh, research you've done with butterflies to birds, because birds yeah. have this, you know, iridescence. Yeah. Um, in so, the wings at right. times. Yeah. So we haven't done that, but but there are other people who work on bird feathers. And so what you find is that, so chitin is the material that insects use, and it's a very good material for this because it has what's called a high refractive index, right, 1.5. So birds do it with keratin, which is the same material you make your hair out of. And it has the same property as a very high refractive index. And they also turn it into nanostructures that can make color. So what you really find is that, you know, in all of these cases, what you're limited by are the laws of physics. And that you have air and whatever this other material is to work with. But within that, you can do all sorts of crazy things. And so birds have their own crazy set of nanostructures that they've been able to make out of keratin fibers as the feather is growing. But the same thing, they can do it. And so interesting enough, in humans, your blue eyes, those are actually also keratin fibers fibers embedded inside that do the light refraction. And the blue butts of monkeys are also keratin fibers that do that. <laughs> uh, yeah, so the, the question was about the transparency. So um, that also, again, started off as a little project in the embryology course a number of years ago. I just brought in I just went to my collection and I pulled up a bunch of transparent butterflies and moths, and I said, I've never really looked at this. Maybe you want to, you guys can look at this and see what you see. So what they did is just do a lot of um, scanning EM on them, right? And what they discovered is, is that everything you can imagine to make a transparent butterfly or moth, a butterfly or moth has figured out how to do. So that includes some moths that have evolved transparent scales. So they have perfectly good scales, but they're just transparent. But the most common solution is to get rid of the scales. But you can't totally get rid of the scales on the wing, because the scales also provide hydrophobicity and keep the wing from getting wet. So what they've done is they've turned the scales into little bristles. So they still repel water, but now the light can go between them. And then they've also often taken the scales or bristles and turned them vertically so that the light can go through. But then the anti-glare coating is a whole other thing. So they've, they've basically, many of them evolved little 100 nanometer nanopillars that diffuse the light. But again, they've evolved it many times, and the structures are not exactly the same. And that's an experiment we, we tried to do this summer, was to look at a bunch of different species and ask how many different morphologies we could see there. But now the question is, how do they build those things? How do they make them? How do they make them just the right size? Yeah. When butterflies puddle, why are they attracted to salt? So it's because, so the, the butterfly, right, most butterflies just have a proboscis that they feed nectar. So nectar is a great source of energy, of sugar, but it's a poor source of everything else. And so they need salts to survive. And so they come to puddles because they know that they can extract it from the soil. Um, from, so especially marsh, you know, certain areas where there's a lot of salt in the water, they really get attracted. But they also know that urine's another good thing to go to, and a lot of gross things are also good for them. And then a few butterflies, one of the longest lived butterflies are the Heliconius butterflies that live in South America. So they can live up to nine months. So they also need amino acids. So they've actually learned to chew pollen as well to extract amino acids from it. Um, uh, okay, yeah, there we go. Mm -hmm. um, so my question has to do with the encoding of some of these structures genetically, because first of all, what's interesting is chitin is a polymer, but like a sugary polymer, but then keratin is a protein that's genetically encoded, but mm -hmm. both of them are capable of forming these nanostructures. So is there another gene that's responsible for encoding the structure, or is it self-assembly and just 
biophysics. And right. So that's a great question. And that I think the idea is that you know, we don't know what would do this, and that's the beauty of the genetic approach, because you just let the genetics tell you what the gene is that actually does it, right? So, it, but we know, you know, we know a lot. The reason we know a lot about chitin synthesis, it's the target of many insecticides. So we know how to kill insects by screwing up that. But we don't know a lot about how the butterflies make any sort of elaborate structure with it. So I think that's the idea with the genetics, is that I couldn't tell you what genes to predict, but the genetics should guide us to the gene that does that. And it will be fascinating to see how it folds that architecture together. And even in the case of keratin, yeah, you do encode it, but it's the same keratin all the time. It's just structured differently. We don't know what does that. I, I have kind of two questions. Um, obviously, some of these wings, as they're genetically modified, to have different hues are twice as thick as other wings from the same species. Are they also twice as heavy? And what happens to the flight characteristics of the butterfly with these mutations? Yeah, so that's a good question. So, but they're not, they're, it's just the lamina that's twice as thick, so you're looking at an incredibly tiny addition. So the, the actual weight would be minimal. Does that make sense? So it's twice as thick, but you're, taking, you're looking at an extra 100 nanometers. And so the total mass of that is very small. But it is an interesting question, because sometimes people ask, well, is actually controlling lamina thickness making the scale stiffer? And the scales do contribute about a 15% increase in flight performance. So there could be some benefits from that, but that's not anything that anyone's looked at in detail. But it's something that's really interesting to keep in mind is another selection pressure on the wing. Uh, I was struck by the incredible diversity of the butterflies, and I have a, the question is, number one, what, what percentage do you think, do you, do you feel that you've actually, uh, you know of the world's butterflies? Are they all typed and, and classified and so on? And the second is, is that uh, diversity and biodiversity being challenged uh, as we see the changes in the climate yeah. that are going on? Yeah. So, I mean, there's probably something on the order of, you know, the estimate is that there might be something like 15 to 20,000 butterfly species. And moths are at least 10 times that, and probably actually way, way more, um, that are described. But the number of undescribed species is probably huge. And there's a lot of cryptic species, things that look similar but are separate species. And so it's the problem that you have with a lot of organisms that you don't know what you're losing. And so when you go into the rainforest, right, you can always find new species that you hadn't found. Interestingly enough, you can even find new species in North America, surprisingly enough, that no one had noticed. So famous story a few years ago, there's something that looked like a very common butterfly called black swallowtails in Illinois. And someone noticed that actually the larvae didn't look right. And they realized it was a completely different species where the adult looked exactly like the common butterfly, but it was a unique species that no one knew about. Um, and so I think there is a huge diversity that's out there that we don't know about. Um, and it is the problem like you have with every organism, that as you lose habitat, you're losing things that you never even knew about. Um, yep. So I'm surprised nobody's asked you this yet, but is a butterfly net all you need to catch some of these specimens, or? What's that? Is a butterfly net all you need to catch some of these specimens, or? Is all you need to catch them? Yeah. yeah. I mean, if you're trying to catch them. I mean, in many of these cases, right, we need to be able to raise the butterflies. So we actually do keep them in captivity. And we have them, or butterfly houses, raise them in captivity. One last question, and then please join us in the mix room. I'm from the Microbial Diversity course. Do you mind if I switch to bacteria? Yeah. We had a student a few years ago who discovered that colonies show yeah. structural colors. Yeah, Lin Key, yeah. Okay, yeah. exactly right. So how would you explain that phenomenon? So, so there are actually some very good papers on that, right? So when the bacterial cell wall reaches the right thickness and the spacing between individual organisms is just right, that you get light refraction. So many things create iridescence without needing it, right? It's a byproduct of what they do. A very good example is um, there was a beautiful paper 
uh, from a, a researcher at Penn State on trachydna clams. So these giant clams that have this beautiful blue-green iridescence. And the question was, well, what's the point of being this beautiful blue-green iridescence? And it turns out the point isn't to be blue and green. It's that they have symbiotic allergy deep inside of them. They need to funnel red light deep into their tissue and they don't want to have blue and green light enter because it's damaging to the tissue, so they reject it. And so they look blue and green, but that's because what they're trying to do is get red into their body, and so they're green for that reason. So we admire them, but that's not actually what they were trying to do. And so I think in some of the bacteria, it's not clear right now that there's a function to that. They, they do it because of a spacing, which is fantastic because then you can you can understand how they build that cell wall in incredible detail because if they change it by 10 nanometers, they're suddenly a different color, which is a fantastic way to screen them then. Yeah, yeah, same thing. All right, thank you very much. Complicated clothes the gyroid. Yeah. Right? That, Probably all you have to do is express a particular protein yeah. and then the membrane and will fold into that shape. So it looks really complicated. Wait, 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 the membrane. So you know, oh sorry. So that gyroid is that fancy folded yeah, yeah. shape, right? But it first starts as folding the membrane and then secreting chitin into it to make that shape. So it's the not that hard. Membrane? Yeah, well the, the ER. Whoa. So and it's not and it turns it's out that it's chitin into the ER. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can, and well, because instead of doing extracellular, it just does yeah. it into the ER. And it turns out that there is a paper that in human HeLa cell, when you misexpress certain proteins, it folds the ER into a gyrum, right? And so that is a low free energy state yeah. in the particular situation. It's like surface area? Nobody knows, right, why it does that. But So you can imagine, again, that there are just our physical laws yeah, that will energy. take over and yeah. make that shape. And it looks super complicated to you, but it is a natural shape for it to take. 